Over the course of this video series, we've seen how special relativity makes a lot of very seemingly weird predictions about how the universe works and predicts things like uh, time dilation, uh, the Doppler shift we've talked about, Doppler shift, there's length contraction. And we've gotten also, we've talked about different versions of the relativistic versions of, of energy and momentum. So special relativity makes predictions about all of these things just based on the two assumptions that first there is no preferred inertial reference frame and that the speed of light is independent of the speed of the source. And in the backgrounds and postulates video, I mentioned a couple of experiments that that made us that got us to believe those two assumptions were true. But these are all predictions of special relativity. And the only way that we can actually tell whether this actually corresponds with with something in reality with with how our universe works is if we match this up with observations. I can make any sort of theory I want. And the only thing that determines whether a theory is any good or not, is whether you can say, I can test in in a real experiment, whether I can see these effects or not. And and if I can't test it, and and I can't have an opportunity to try to disprove these things, well, then my, my theory is really no good. So what I want to do in this video is, is just mention a couple of the, uh, uh, highlight a couple of the experiments that have been done that match these things up. And the most common way that these are, these are tested is in, in particle accelerators. So, so in particle accelerators like CERN, I, I take, you know, small protons or, or some, or various other particles and I accelerate them to extremely fast speeds. And, and here's another particle that I've, that I've accelerated. And they, they collide with each other. And, well, maybe they'll deflect off of each other in, in different directions. And what I can do for, the first thing I can do is just measure the energy and momentum of the particles that are going into this collision. And then I can measure the energy and momentum of the particles coming out. And, and sometimes with high energy collisions, I can get like a, a spray of different particles coming out and, and all of these weird effects. But I can measure the energy and momentum that I start with and the energy and momentum that I finish with. And we find that the version of energy and momentum that is actually conserved is this relativistic energy and momentum. So, so we do actually find things like E equals MC squared for, for moving part for massive particles. Uh, for, for length contraction, this is length contraction is probably the hardest one to actually directly measure. But again, in accelerator experiments, you can do something like, let's say I, I take an atomic nucleus. So, so there's the nucleus and we can have you know, some, some protons in there and some neutrons. I'm not going to draw them different colors, but you get the point. And I accelerate this to, again, a very fast speed. And I, I collide that with another, with another atomic nuclei. So there's more protons and neutrons in here. And this is, this is, these particles are accelerated towards each other. And in the ensuing collision, what happens is since these particles are moving so fast, their length is contracted along the direction of their motion. So instead of it looking like uh, two spheres colliding with each other, it looks a lot more like two pancakes that are colliding with each other. We still have all of the uh, uh, nucleons in here. And this corresponds to a, a much higher nucleon density. And, and this length contraction is a good way that uh, that we understand the results we get from these kind of these kind of collision experiments. Uh, for for the effect of relativistic Doppler shift, there's a difference 
between the classical prediction of Doppler shift, the, the Doppler, the equation for Doppler shift that Newton derived, and the equation for Doppler shift that, that Einstein derived. And you can set up an experiment where, let's say I have uh, a source here, I, I have a source of charged particles, and these are going to be glowing particles that are emitted from this source and they, they fly to the other side of my apparatus. And these charged particles may be glowing. It might be a cathode ray tube or something like that. But we can put a receiver, let's say we put a receiver in the middle of there, then when, the, when we have light, when we have particles that are moving towards the receiver, the light that they give off will appear to be blue shifted. It'll appear at a higher frequency than if, you know, it was just emitting radiation while it was just standing beside me. When it's moving away from me, well, the wavelength is going to appear to be longer. It's going to be redshifted. And if it's moving, uh, moving in a transverse direction, if it's kind of just passing by me, then the classical theory, uh, Newton's theory, says... There shouldn't be any, uh, there shouldn't be any Doppler shift of of the light coming off of these charged particles, but relativity does say that yes, due to time dilation, there's still going to be there's still going to be some kind of Doppler shift. So, the classical theory and Einstein's theory, and the relativistic theory, uh, disagree on that. So you can test it, and lo and behold. The, it's the relativistic theory that actually that actually matches what we see in, in these experiments. Now, for the for time dilation, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail on this one because I find this to be a, a really interesting experiment. And in it was one of the first observations that actually verified uh, one of these effects. It was a long time before we could make large particle accelerators that could smash ions together at very high velocities. So this experiment was done by two guys, uh, Rossi and Hall, and has been repeated a lot of times since. Uh, and this was done in 1941, so over 35 years after uh, relativity came out. And this uh, experiment deals with particles called muons. Uh, these are subatomic particles that are basically like heavy electrons. Uh, heavy electrons. They have the same charge. Uh, as far as we know, they're not made up of anything smaller, just like electrons, but they're just way a lot more than electrons. Now, if you produce these in a lab, which we can do, we can, uh, we can produce these in a lab, then they will decay very rapidly. In fact, they only have a half-life, a half-life of 2.2 microseconds. So if I have a sample of, of muons here, uh, just sitting here, in 2.2 microseconds, if, this is a hun if I have 100 muons here, then half of my sample will have, uh, will have decayed due to, uh, due to various pro processes. So every 2.2 millionths of a second, uh, my sample gets cut in half. Now, these particles are created, uh, can be created when, let's say this is the Earth and, and this is the upper atmosphere, when high energy cosmic rays, so cosmic rays, when high energy cosmic rays hit the upper atmosphere, this produces these muons. And they will continue to, to fall down into the atmosphere decaying as they go. Now what Rossi and Hall did was, uh, and, and this was done by, by more, people, uh, more people after this uh, to higher accuracies, was they said, all right, we're going to go up on top of a mountain and maybe this mountain is something like uh, uh, 2,000 meters high. So 2,000 meters high. And we're going to measure, we're going to stand up here, and we're going to measure 
how many muons uh, pass by us. So, so they, they measured how many muons are, are up here. Now, if these muons are going at near the speed of light, uh, so, so these muons are going 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, a little bit less since we know that things can't go faster than light, but if they're moving that fast and in 2.2 microseconds, they lose half of their, uh, uh, their numbers are cut in half. So 2.2 times 10 to the negative six seconds. Then that means that in about every 660 meters, you can multiply these two together. That means they'll travel 660 meters before half of them decay. Okay, and this is the, this is the classical picture. So according to this classical picture, if I start out with 100% uh, of the sample that I saw at the top of the mountain, then when I go down 660 meters, when I go down to about here, I should only see 50% of the sample. And as I go down another 600 meters, I'll only see 25% of the sample. And as I get down to here, I should only see about 12% of the sample. So this is the classical picture, and you would, if uh, you don't believe relativity, when you look down here, when you measure the amount of muons that are passing, you should only get about 12% the amount of muons that, were, that you measured at the top of the mountain. But what they noticed is that you measure way more muons than you would have expected. Instead of it being 12% of the amount that you uh, measured at the top of the mountain, it was closer to 60%. So it, it's not even close. And the reason that there were so many more muons making it down to the bottom is that this time is the time for that it takes the muons to decay when they're at rest. If these muons are moving, then due to time dilation, we see their clocks run slower. So as if their clocks are running slower, it will appear that they're decaying at a slower rate than this. So, so when they measured them near the ground, they measured a much larger, uh, higher, higher number of, uh, of muons than they expected. And that was a verification of, uh, of time dilation. And, and this is exactly how they do this. And this experiment is actually done uh, in a similar way, in kind of a smaller scale way, in, in undergraduate labs now. Like, this is, is a fairly routine experiment. So I just want to go through this, this experiment in a little bit more detail to say that, wow, when particles are moving, their clocks actually do run slower. Uh, and, and these are some of the predictions of, of, general, of special relativity. And all of these strange effects that, that seem completely alien to us actually do happen, and this actually corresponds with the way that our universe works.